Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the second lecture of this course, Advanced Quantum Mechanics. Uh, the lecture today will be somewhat unusual. I would uh, say from very beginning that it will uh, add very much to your practical skills, how to solve advanced quantum mechanics problem. Uh, however, it is important, perhaps most important in the course. It will set up as uh, the scheme at which all phenomena of advanced quantum mechanics actually take place. Right? It's called identical particles. First, we will figure out what identity means for quantum particles. It's very different from identity in classical physics. Well, for that, we just look at Schrodinger equation uh, for identical particles. We will recognize symmetries, imitation symmetry in particular, which is in these equations. We will talk a little bit about symmetries in quantum mechanics in general, right? Then we will discuss symmetry postulate. Symmetry postulate is uh, kind of simple. The particles are either fermions or bosons. What does it imply for possible wave functions? Well, perhaps you know it's symmetric and asymmetric uh, wave function. And we'll try to understand why is it so, what does this mean, and uh, what does it give rise to? We will talk about quantum fields. Then we will uh, do some, I would say, even boring work, trying to symmetrize and anti-symmetrize wave functions. Of course, it will work. Um, again, it uh, the work which we do thereby is kind of uh, overwhelming. We would hardly do anything with these symmetrized and anti-symmetrized functions in the future, um, except a couple of presentations. But they exist, and uh, what is important for us that they form special Hilbert space, quantum mechanical space, Fock space, right? So we will we will end up constructing Fock space, and from there on we will work in this Fock space, right? In the next lecture, we will talk about creation and annihilation apparatus, which actually enable effective work in this space. But it doesn't come today. So that's why I'm saying that it's not very practical, this lecture. But again, important, because it's really basis at which you and me, everybody, will work in advanced quantum mechanics. I would repeat that the questions go to the chat. Uh, and I like questions because it's a kind of feedback. Otherwise, I feel alone. Uh, right, if the question is not answered, please speak up. I would also appreciate this. Fine. I don't hear anything, so let me start with uh, the following. We know uh, Schrodinger equation for a single particle. Let me now have money. Let me have n particles. I will make them identical version, <coughs> but let me just talk about n particles. What does it imply? For a single particle wave function was just a function of a single vector coordinate of three variables. 
for n particles that will be a function of all particle coordinates, function with them three times n arguments. Here it is. Uh, annotation which will be used frequently in the course. It's kind of very inconvenient to, 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 to uh, write long rows like this. And I will compact it like this. So anytime you have this curly brackets, it would uh, indicate that I have a row of variables or row of numbers. All right. So my function will depend on condensed all of all the particles, uh, which uh, kind of uh, makes it very complex. Fine. To determine this wave function, to figure out what are stationary solutions uh, for this wave functions, eigenfunctions of energy, we need the Hamiltonian. Let's make it up. Right. Uh, first of all, uh, if we um, have a single particle, we know what the Hamiltonian is. It's a kinetic energy of the particle and potential energy. All right, suppose particles are independent. What does it mean? That uh, energies uh, of this sort, they would just sum up. So I sum up the Hamiltonians. Right, I sum up Hamiltonians, there are n terms in the sum. Each term is a single particle Hamiltonian. As you see, at the moment I have index i, which refers to a certain particle. Uh, right, let us see what do we have to do to make particle identical. Well, if they're identical, it's just the same. They should have the same masses. So I remove index I here. They should feel the same potential energy. Right. So I made them identical. Uh, let us see. Besides, um, uh, there is interaction between particles. What does it mean in terms of Hamiltonian? There is uh, energy coming to the Hamiltonian, which depends on coordinates of the particles. Well, what I have here, here I have pairwise interaction. So each pair of particles contributes to energy. It could be, for instance, Coulomb law. For Coulomb law, this uh, quantity, uh, let's see, E squared, there was some, um, I should never remember this system international's very uh, funny thing. Um, and uh, uh, here we have Coulomb law, right? So modulus of uh, difference of coordinates of two particles. Fine, uh, what do I uh, have to uh, do here to make them identical? Well, I also have to remove the synthesis. And perhaps it's uh, plausible to make it a function of difference. But anyway, the coordinates of particles are different. I could not remove indices i and j from the coordinates of the particles. Fine. Mm, right, I could think of more complex interactions, like an interaction which involves three particles, which is energy which depends on three coordinates. Well, it could exist. Uh, right, uh, 
it is seldom used in physics, but in a way it could exist as effective interaction, for instance. Um, all right, also here indices should be removed to make these particles identical. Fine, uh, now let us look again at all these terms with indices removed. And we understand that it's, this Hamiltonian is symmetric with respect to permutations. If you permute coordinates of particle i and particle j, the Hamiltonian will stay precisely the same. Is this point clear? You say yes. Uh, the factors, yeah, uh, one half and uh, one six uh, come from. Um, let, let's talk about one half. It, it, it's not very important, just matter of uh, counting particles, right, Bernard? It's uh, double counting. So look what I have here. I sum up over all i and j's for i which is not equal j, which means that I uh, count each pair of particles twice. First, for instance, uh, i equals one and j equals two and uh, i equals uh, two, j equals one, it, it, it refers to the same pair. That's why I divided by two to uh, remove this double counting. Uh, why the potentials of identical particles uh, are the same? The potential is not an intrinsic property of a particle, but an external effect, right? You're right, it's an external effect. But it's if the particles are identical, they should react to this external effect in pretty much the same way. Otherwise, you would be able to distinguish these particles. All right. Fine. Good. Thank you for the questions. It was an important point to understand. Starting point. Uh, let us talk about symmetries and quantum mechanics in general. It is a kind of topic which is in principle in your courses, uh, but I would like to uh, make a point about this, which uh, is sometimes missed in the courses. Um, let me present it like this. We are talking about symmetry in general. I will give concrete examples. And uh, if the Hamiltonian is symmetric with respect to some symmetry operation, it's uh, very important to whatever understand, remember that the solutions to this Hamiltonian, that uh, wave functions corresponding to this Hamiltonian are generally non-symmetric. Rather, and I'm going to say a pretty mathematical uh, um, words, but it's a kind of very lively and important mathematics. It's group theory uh, and uh, symmetry transformations, they form a group. Uh, right, these solutions belong to a certain irreducible representation of this symmetry. Uh, difficult words. Who of you ever heard of irreducible representations? Yeah. Fast majority uh, did not uh, know this word, this word, 
But apart from it, uh, from uh, your course of quantum mechanics, you already know some. Perhaps you just don't know the term. Uh, let me consider a potential which has special symmetry, which is called mirror symmetry. Right, so you have some, uh, this is energy, this is a, a coordinate, and let me consider a potential like this. Mirror symmetry. It looks like it's a later potential in the origin. What can I say about the levels, about energy levels uh, of this Hamiltonian? You might want to recall the wave functions of uh, oscillator or wave functions of a particle in a box, which is also mirror symmetric. It turns out that the levels can be either symmetric. Let me put several symmetric levels or anti-symmetric. With respect to this transformation. Uh, uh, let us see, let me sketch a wave function of a symmetric level. Something like that. For anti-symmetric anti level, well, it would be something like this. Okay. So, mathematically, we have two sorts of wave functions. Right. For some of them, if you change x to minus x, you have the same wave function. But for some of them, it's exactly the opposite. So the Hamiltonian is symmetric, but these wave functions are not symmetric. Well, they say in mathematical terms that uh, this simple group of uh, mirror transformation has only two terms, uh, two members in the group, identity and uh, reflection, that has two irreducible uh, representations. Symmetric and anti-symmetric. Fine, that you know from the course. Again, you don't uh, perhaps didn't use these words. Uh, again, something which you know, but perhaps never recognized as a uh, irreducible representation. This is uh, about the momentum, right? Remember, atoms, in, uh, they produce spherical potentials and wave functions, atomic wave functions. They possess a certain quantum number, usually related to orbital momentum of the electron. What are these functions? Well, perhaps you know it from chemistry or from atomic physics. Uh, for instance, there are Funct uh, uh, and yeah, I forgot to say this symmetry, spherical symmetric potential is a symmetry with respect to all rotations, with respect to all axes in coordinate space. It is uh, quite a group and it has a fallen set of irreducible re representations. Completely symmetric wave function, whatever you rotate, you have the same. Vector representation which is called uh, uh, p-orbitals, all right? You know that there are three uh, p-orbitals, x, y, z. You draw it like this. And it's actually uh, pretty similar to a vector. Three components correspond to components of a vector. And upon rotation transformation, they are transformed as vectors, right? So if you take PZ, if you rotate it with respect to Y axis about 90 degrees, you got PX, right? 
uh, and it goes on and on. One can consider d orbitals, and they transformed as uh, tensors, and the degeneracy of d uh, orbitals. So here we have three. The degeneracy is five. So there is another example of irreducible representation. Um, it also seems that this has something to do with degeneracy of wave functions. All this with degener uh, all the, these functions are not degenerate, uh, but there are also multi-dimensional reproducible representations. So they define degeneracy either non-degenerate or three or five. Right. This is a, a short introduction in group theory. Uh, perhaps you have never heard it, although it's a kind of important for physicists to get some gasp on group theory. Um, uh, but you certainly know the examples. And there's a message again that uh, if the Hamiltonian is symmetric, wave functions of the Hamiltonian doesn't have to be symmetric. Moreover, they frequently non-symmetric, obey some irreducible representation. Uh, for the symmetry of the wave function, do we look, do we only look at the radial orbital part or also at the face of the wave function? Uh, I don't understand uh, this as an opposition. Radial, radial orbital part and the face. Or perhaps you um, talk about separation of wave function in radial coordinates. So this wave function of uh, a vector R is a function of uh, R and the function of the angles. Perhaps you mean this, but this is not the face. It's uh, just a, a part of the function which depends on the angles. Right. If you rotate, this stays the same. It doesn't, it's not important. This part angular dependent part is transferred, right? If this uh, constant, it is symmetric uh, and there are, there are these angular functions corresponding to all these representations. Uh, good, right. So this is uh, something important we, we have just learned about quantum mechanics. Uh, let us see how does it work in our case. The case of permutation symmetry. All right. Let us make it a little bit more symmetrical. Let us introduce operators of permutation. Right. So that permutes particles N and M. Uh, what's important is that uh, I it looks a bit like a reflection. If you apply a reflection twice, you got the same, you get identity. Uh, the same is permutations. If you apply permutation twice, you got identity. The same permutation is the same order. All right, uh, sir, uh, what is the result? How this operator works and wave function? Well, uh, it just uh, for at least for two particles uh, flips the coordinates of the particle. Uh, right, let us talk about irreducible representations so that all possible waves with which wave functions are transformed upon permutation. Uh, there are simple one-dimensional reducible representations. 
And they're uh, very much uh, the same as uh, those for mirror potential, right? The wave function can be remain symmetric with respect to this permutation, or it can be anti-symmetric. Why is it so? Because if you apply this twice, you get the same. Right. If uh, you change this, the, the, if you flip the sign of wave function twice, what wave, wave function twice, you get the same. You get identity. Uh, however, it turns out that permutation group actually allows complex multi-dimensional irreducible representation. If you look at the book, there is a, a, an example which is elaborated there. Uh, and uh, that due to multi-dimensional character of these representations, uh, it would be a kind of uh, complex to operate with those. And in fact, uh, permutation group, or shall I say, is the mother of all groups. Actually, any group, whatever complex and awful it is, can be seen as a subset of certain permutation group. Permutation group is very rich. Can be very, can give rise to very complex irreducible representations. Find a blessing or whatever triviality, these representations do not occur in nature. So there is a symmetry with respect to permutations. From general reasoning, one could expect a very complex situation in this context. But kind of uh, write my um, uh, favorite uh, kind of thought is that our word is eventually not that complex and uh, whatever threatening as it seems to us, it's rather a, a sandbox. It's rather a sandbox where we play, learn something, and some things are kind of uh, look intentionally simplified for us to understand. For me, that is a particular, uh, particular example. All right, so let me lame these presentations. Let me formulate what is symmetry postulate. Um, as you know, uh, that uh, refers to all postulates. Um, postulate, in principle, something which you have to accept, which is imposed on you. But after you accepted this, you could think of just define it, as always happen, right? Uh, suppose a law is imposed on you about uh, whatever curfew, curfew uh, then some people have a tendency to justify it. Sometimes people have tendency to oppose it. But anyway, it's imposed. Uh, symmetry postulate. And what is this? What is this law? That uh, of all possibilities, uh, identical particles can be either bosons. And then the wave function of many particles is symmetric with respect to all permutations, whatever pair of particles, well, it is, it works this way. It is symmetric. And our only alternative are fermionic particles. And in this case, uh, whatever a permutation, the wave function of the system of fermions is anti-symmetric, it flips the sign. 
right. And as I say, somebody, something forbids more complex irreducible representations, which as we will see, as we will feel, as we compute, gives a great reduction of number of possible quantum states of the system of identical particles. Right. Uh, again, uh, from Janis, uh, for me, it's still not really clear what this irreducible representation is. Could you maybe say something about this? Um, do you want me, uh, do you want more mathematical definition for me or shall I just uh, say in words what I want you to know? Right, the reducible representation is a label of certain wave function in a symmetric potential. Uh, for instance, for mirror potential, there are two labels, symmetric and disymmetric. Representations is simple, uh, it doesn't cause extra degeneracy. For more complex group, for more complex symmetry, rotational symmetry, these labels are S, P, D, F, and so on. These labels correspond to eigen uh, values of uh, square root of momentum aperture. So there are different sorts of wave functions. And for me, it's important that you understand the reducible representation as this fact. Does it answer your question? Okay. Uh, good, let me come uh, back here. So, it is a great reduction of the number of possible states. We will actually figure out what are uh, the states uh, we have to disregard. And um, we, um, uh, it is kind of perhaps a rather implicit way to confirm symmetry postulate experimentally. So in fact, uh, symmetry postulate to some extent has been uh, experimentally verified yet long before quantum mechanics. In works of Gibbs, when he considered entropy of an uh, ideal gas. Ideal gas can be also in many states and number of states, possible states, defines entropy. And uh, actually Gibbs have figured out that entropy does not include permutations of particles. Entropy is something which one can measure in thermodynamics experimentally, it has been confirmed. So, in fact, uh, to some extent, the symmetry postulate comes from uh, thermodynamics, from whatever steam engines, rather than from quantum mechanics. Right, anyway, it's something given which is property of this word, which has been experimentally observed and understood. These extra states are not observed. Let us see, right. It means that uh, identity in uh, 
quantum mechanics is a deeper quantity, a deeper concept than in uh, in uh, classical mechanics. It's not just particles have have same masses charges interact with potential in the same way. They say they are indistinguishable. Uh, perhaps the best way uh, to understand this or to feel this emotionally, right? Uh, you get emotional when you teach it, usually. Um, and these symmetry postulate eventually uh, greatly reduces some cheating opportunities. Um, let me, how can I say, I, I would like to, 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 to show you a small experiment. But uh, my window uh, is small and I don't want to stop share. Or perhaps I can do the following. I can stop share for a second and then resume it, but then you would see the experiment in a, in, in a small window. Um, yeah. Okay, then just click pin. Uh, click, click pin on my window and you would see experiment and then uh, the sharing window will perhaps be in a smaller window. That's enough. Good. So, uh, under normal circumstances, I usually do it with two pieces of chalk. But anyway, there are many representations of identity. So, I have two identical particles. You see that. One cannot distinguish them. First particle is on my left. Second particle is on my right. That's going to be one state. Now I remove the particles. So second particle is on my left. First particle is on my right. Fine. I permuted the particles and you have seen it. Now you all close your eyes. Open your eyes. Which state it is? Which state do I have now? Is first particle on the left or on the right? Is second particle on the left or on the right? You cannot know. No, no. One is on the left and other on the right. It is clear. I, I, I am in the middle. I distinguish left and right. Good. What does it mean? It means that I could cheat you. So there are states, uh, let me draw it, quantum mechanical state, first particle on the left. Uh, okay, uh, yeah, okay, you should, you should see it clearly. This is one state. And another state, And you have no way to distinguish these states. So I can cheat you uh, transferring the system to another state and uh, you have no way to, to figure out which state it is. Symmetry postulate solves this problem in a very creative, and this is a way. Symmetry postulate, let's, uh, let, let us think uh, of these particles as bosons. 
symmetry postulates that there's only one state. Which is symmetric combination of the two. There's no way that the, the system of particles can be in uh, one state, one of these states, LL, LR, or RL. They are always in symmetric superposition of the two, which means that if I exchange particles with you seen or not seen, I do not change the state. Right? So um, please uh, pay attention to this factor of one half. It's not an abrupt factor. I need to normalize the resulting uh, wave function, right? So this is normalization factor. Um, let us see, uh, for fermions, I would have to change sign. Then eventually upon, uh, upon fermentation, uh, of course also that should have taken different color, but it doesn't matter. Uh, this wave function changes sign. Uh, but uh, one cannot measure the sign of the wave function. Uh, what you can measure expectation values. It's always uh, two size coming. So one can uh, don't uh, don't have possibility to, to detect sign anyhow. Sign is a bit too. Very good. So the uh, um, symmetry postulate greatly reduces the number of uh, the states and uh, thereby enables us to know exactly which state it is. I guess it's time to have, uh, yeah, let's uh, make a break now. Let's make a um, eight minute break. I will stop the recording. All right, let us go on. As you have seen, symmetry postulate greatly reduces the number of possible wave functions and uh, reduces some teaching opportunities or whatever. Um, it makes us able to distinguish states. It reduces the state, it, it uh, kind of wipes out all states, which we cannot distinguish. <laughs> and eventually, if you start from this point, if you recognize identity of particles, First mathematical ways and began to think about this, about the consequences. Uh, you come to a very important idea, perhaps the most uh, important discovery in the history of humankind. You come to the concepts of quantum fields. And the logics to follow is eventually rather simple. It might even seem ridiculously simple, but it was very important at some time to recognize this. Good. What symmetry postulate tells us? It tells that the wave function is either symmetric or anti-symmetric. So for any pair of fermions, the wave function is anti-symmetric. Okay, let's uh, take, let's catch a fermion. It's possible. You could make a quantum dot, some uh, heterostructure, potential, put gates, electrodes, and actually catch 
an electron. So let's catch one uh, electron here in the left. And at the same time, our colleagues in Japan is out even telling us in some of the underground laboratory, do the same experiment, catching an electron. And the wave functions of these electrons are anti-symmetric. How do they know about each other? How could it be possible? Very important principle in physics is locality. That something which happens here now is defined by uh, some uh, things which are closer to here and now. How the hell particles in Japan and uh, Holland can know about each other? I could think of electron and phaser galaxies, whatever. But it has to change the way you think about this. Uh, yes, Bernard, I will answer your question. Um, one has uh, to change the way uh, one thinks about this. And then uh, an important conclusion emerges. Such long correlations can only come about or some entity, which is precisely the same, in Japan, in Holland, in all points of our universe. And this entity is called the field. It's fermionic field, a property of our space, of our world, to have fermionic excitations, electrons. So this symmetry postulate, supplemented by our reasoning, actually forbids past particles in uh, a way they are known in uh, classical physics. Particles which are independent if you separate them uh, by big distance. There are no such particles in nature. Because all particles are eventually excitations of the same field, the field which is supposed to be the same in all points of our universe. I don't know, we didn't travel much in the universe, perhaps there are um, regions when there are no electrons. Uh, we don't know this precisely. But at the moment, the model of our world, the model of our universe, that it, this field is actually present in the whole universe. It's a property of the world. It's a property of uh, vacuum, right? Important point to understand that even there is no, if, even if there are no particles, there is a field, there is a potential hidden somewhere in the structure from the vacuum of our emptiness. There is a potential to have excitations of certain sort. So that's how concept of quantum field has originated. And although conclusion is striking, it comes from simple elaboration on symmetry postulate. Right, does this have anything to do with entanglement? Uh, yes or no? Um, entanglement is a concept which is um, uh, useful and um, can be applied in the context of uh, quantum computation, quantum manipulation. 
same as that. Uh, and indeed, they, uh, to some extent, it shows to which extent two particles to quantum systems are not dependent. But it um, implies an ability to entangle and disentangle. These two electrons, one can say that they are entangled in this way, that wave function is always antisymmetric. We have no means to disentangle these electrons. That's why usually it's not called entanglement. Just for the reasons that he cannot disentangle them. Does it answer your question, Bernard? Bernard, yeah. Um, Wilhelm, does this field imply that all electrons know about each other? Yes, they do. Uh, right, perhaps from uh, for, uh, there's a part of students which uh, follow my course of uh, quantum transport that we also uh, seen in quantum transport. Uh, we have a nano a nanostructure and electrons come far from the left, from from the right, and if they were particles, uh, they would come independently. In fact, they're not; they're correlated. Because they are fermions, they are eventually quanta of electronic field, but not independent particles, right? So all electrons in the world, they know about each other because they have the same parent. They come from the same field. Uh, hope this answers your question. So let us see. I could uh, say uh, much more about um, uh, yes, is it similar for bosons? Yes, precisely the same. Two bosons are always in symmetric wave function, whatever the separation between these two bosons, precisely the same principle. Uh, so let me talk a little bit about uh, something which I'm not going to talk uh, except the last lecture. Let me talk about relativistic uh, uh, quantum field theory. So the natural idea is to combine um, quantum fields, which is a property of the whole universe, with the most fundamental symmetry of the universe with relativity which shows that space and time are eventually the same uh, facets of single entity for dimensional uh, space. Um, there are more symmetries uh, coming from relativity, which uh, I don't want to discuss now. Some of them are pretty known. For instance, uh, you have heard uh, many times that there is uh, a relation between spin and statistics. Um, I will give you a second to recall which one. Uh, right, so all bosons have integer spin and all fermions have uh, half integer spin. Right, uh, it uh, is mainly meant to explain properties of elementary particles. Something which you can observe in uh, experiments with uh, large machinery, with colliders, some resonances and data, um, whatever. Um, but rather, the development of uh, relativistic quantum field theory um, goes far beyond and uh, it uh, tries to understand how our world is made like, like it is made. So there are many uh, developments which are very interesting like string series, like De Bruyne ser uh, uh, series when people play with very fundamental things like geometry, symmetry, quantum mechanics, trying to understand how our world is 
made or could, could have been made. Uh, right, uh, what can I say? It actually celebrates uh, intellectual power of humankind, uh, perhaps the most intellectually involved uh, field in, uh, in, uh, in the world. And uh, many people, um, who many PhD students who studied this field, they got excellent jobs. Uh, they got jobs in banks because uh, although it's very interesting uh, and uh, I would say noble activity, it has so far uh, little applications. Uh, right, that's one of the reasons why I don't start with relativistic quantum uh, theory from now on and till the end of my course. I will try to say something about more practical, about something which we uh, could make ourselves. So that would be about the last uh, slide uh, about uh, relativistic quantum field theory. Only in the last lecture, we will shortly talk about this. Uh, let us see the uh, questions from Sasha. But if you create an, an electron in Delft and uh, one in Japan, how can they know about each other at the point? They're still limited by the speed of light for information transfer, right? That's precisely the point. That's precisely the point. Uh, the fact that they are caught. This information cannot travel between Holland and Japan. Whatever, due to speed of light limitations or because of a kind of uh, uh, well, no flights uh, as it is a uh, current situation. No internet connection, for instance. Nevertheless, they know about each other because they are quantum of the same field. Um, to permute them, it is a kind of challenging task. One really has to have uh, flights running, um, but it just uh, could provide experimental proof of anti-symmetry of the wave function. It cannot make them, it cannot deny this fact, right? Has it ever been proven that there is this one field or is it that's for some interesting thing? Uh, so, so, sorry, I, I have low volume. I have to increase this, otherwise I don't have your own. Um, my question is, is whether or not this has been scientifically proven. Which has been sound of? If it's been scientifically proven, like if we've had experiments that have confirmed these. Uh, of course, it's, it's been proven every day and every minute that uh, the wave functions of electrons are anti-symmetric. Has there been an experiment with, a, with the same field measurement? Do you mean if anybody happened? made a real experiment with uh, two electrons in uh, Poland and Japan? I don't think so, um, and the point one well, needs quite some uh, funds to make such an experiment. And uh, nobody would give you such funds because uh, people kind of know that uh, that um, the wave function is uh, anti-symmetric. From the variety of simple experiments which have been done. How do you define know about each other? Uh, I can define as any information transfer, either by direct interaction, for instance, Coulomb interaction between electrons, or by uh, messaging 
So one experiment, uh, one um, experimental is measure something about the electron. Uh, sends a, 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 a CMS to, to, to Holland, right? Uh, another exper um, experiment is does something with, with uh, electron in Holland. That's my definition of uh, information transfer. Yeah, there are different ways, uh, again, such as there are different ways to prevent uh, the information transfer. It could be just relativistic limitation, or could be inter internet interruptions, or could be a, a, a metallic, uh, metallic um, wall, which isolates these electrons, isolates the column field. But uh, whatever, the fact that this information transfer is not necessary to keep these wave functions anti-symmetric. It just made this way, and this is this uh, just uh, uh, strongly suggests that there is an entity which is the same in uh, in um, Holland and uh, Japan. Uh, again, the consequences is that there are quantum fields in this universe. There are no particles. The quantum fields, the properties of uh, empty skin, vacuum, this property is a potential to have particles, to have excitations, which we normally call and see as particles. Uh, fine, uh, let's see how I'm doing with respect to time. Oh, it's okay. Good. Let's make our hand study. Let's make some uh, work um, in uh, figuring out what are actual uh, wave functions of the Schrodinger equation for n particles. Uh, let me, for simplicity, assume no interaction. So the Hamiltonian is just the sum of one particle Hamiltonians. You see that masses are the same, uh, potentials are the same. So they, uh, they um, are identical in classical sense of this word, right? Uh, let me start with this Hamiltonian and let me, and this is possible for this simple Hamiltonian, let me figure out all possible solutions, all possible energy levels. Good, uh, yeah, the, the uh, thing which enables doing this job is a, is a uh, variable separation in this Hamiltonian, right? What does it mean? If we know eigenvalue of a single particle, like defined like this. So there was a wave function which depends on single coordinate only. We can solve it, we can regularize this Hamiltonian. We got energy levels for a single particle. Then any solution to this Hamiltonian can be presented as a product of this eigenfunctions. Right. There are many solutions of the kind one can make, and I guess I have the, them all. Right, I have n particles, so I uh, order the product in this way, first, first particle, second, particle number n, and I index the wave functions. Uh, right. And this shows index i with index one shows in which level the first particle is. 
And that shows where I put the second particle and so on till n. All right. So this is eventually a general solution. And here I again use the symbol. It's a long uh, row of, of all possible eigenvalues. Fine, well, one could just put it and uh, check uh, mathematically that it's satisfied by this connectivity. Uh, all right, let us uh, figure out energies corresponding to these wave functions. All right, energy of the state. Oh, that's not, not, um, uh, very uh, complex since particles independent, whatever this, uh, the resulting energy is the sum of all um, particle energies. And here are some over the particles. So for each particle, I take proper energy which depends on the uh, number of the level at which it is situated. Let me uh, resum it a little bit differently. It will be very, very useful for us in the near future. Let me, instead of summing over particles, sum over the levels. So each level with label K has energy E of K. And I just uh, multiply it with the number of particles which are in this particular level. Good. So if I, uh, this uh, energy in these terms uh, are pretty much uh, defined. If I change number of particles in certain level, I would uh, uh, change this energy. But this states can be degenerate in a sense that I, uh, can have, uh, for instance, a particle, um, several particles in the same uh, level. And since I have to imply, um, have to post any symmetry or symmetry, well, uh, those will be different states. So we can figure out how many states actually have the same energy. Uh, so how, how many states are eventually thrown away by symmetry postulate? Um, the subscript I of uh, small i. It gives uh, which level the particle number i is, right? If I write, for instance, this combination phi three r one phi five r two, then um, i one is three, I uh, two is, as you can figure out, is five. All right. Good, uh, right. How many states have the same energy? Well, uh, we just uh, have this, uh, number of particles in each level, right? And in this terms is a certain subset of number of particles in each level, the energy is the same, but we can 
äh, bemüht Partik, äh, Partik als wir sagen, changing this number. So it is uh, this um, extra state, the generosity of a certain state, equals to uh, the number of ways to put n k balls to the box k. Uh, let us see. Let's start with the first box, first level. We have n particles and um, all right, then there's some, uh, how do you call it, the combinatorics coming into play. Um, uh, in total, we have n capital particles, and that's how many ways are there to put uh, n one of them into, into the first, below, uh, first box. That type of uh, factorial. Right? Combinatorics. I uh, do not want to explain it because it's uh, rather long. You should have seen this at least once. Who has never seen this um, expression with factorials? This one. Perhaps everybody has seen. Good. So I had n particles. I put n one to the box. Right now I have uh, I got that many possibilities. Now I have to fill uh, another box. I have lesser particles, and uh, uh, that's number of uh, combinations I will have. Uh, fill in the second box. So on, I go step by step. I reduce the number of particles I have to distribute, and uh, sooner or later I fill all the boxes. So what would be the result? The result will be the following. It is a factorial of number of particles divided by the product of factorials of number of particles in each box. Factorials are enormous numbers. I don't want you, I don't want you to impress without reason with uh, these numbers, but even for like uh, 10, Particles, these numbers can be enormous. So, if you look at all solutions of Schrödinger equation for uh, n identical particles, there's enormous number of solutions at the same energy. Um, fine. Let me uh, go on. Let me tell what uh, uh, sim uh, what the symmetry postulate uh, does, and let me talk about Boson symmetric wave function. Um, kind of the message is that uh, the state is uniquely defined by a set of occupation numbers. So for each n is only one state, which means that all states have degeneracy one. That's what I told you about the absence of teaching. There are no states which cannot be distinguished in at least energy. Right, so how to figure out what is the wave function? Okay, we know that it should obey symmetry postulate. So we uh, need to sum up over all possible permutations, right? We take first one, we permute coordinates, we take another one, right? And uh, that's uh, how many permutations, how many wave functions we should take. Eh? Okay. 
and we have to make equal weight superposition of all these wave functions. Let me recall that we have already made this dupe. We have taken uh, first particle on the left, first, uh, second particle on the right. There were two wave functions and we have symmetrized it. We took one. and made symmetric combination. Good, the same we can do for three particles in three different levels, there will be six combinations. Uh, okay, it's still doable, but yeah, if there are 10 particles, then the number of uh, possible terms is really enormous. Uh, but anyway, they all come with the same coefficient and with a normalization factor, which uh, we still have to compute. Uh, but in fact, we have almost computed it. Mm, let's compute it. So we need to normalize the resulting function. Normalization is uh, C squared. And uh, that's what I have from summation over all possible permutations. All right. From this double sum, since uh, these states are orthogonal, I just got the number of states, number of permutations. But that we have computed already. So that gives me this value of C. It is uniquely defined by occupation numbers, number of particles in a given uh, level, and the total number of particles. Again, the main message is here. Each set of occupation numbers gives rise to precisely one state for bosons. All right. But it uh, kind of becomes um, if I knew that, and if my task would be to define the wave function for 10 particles, that would drive me desperate, certainly. Because I would understand that I would have to deal with zillions and zillions of terms. Right. Let me repeat uh, the same for um, anti-symmetric wave function. In this way, we fix the filling numbers. Again, we have a certain set of filling numbers, which means that we have a certain energy. If you go, if you change filling numbers, you will get generally a, a different energy. Right. Now let us uh, recall Pauli principle for fermions. That in this case for fermions, um, occupation numbers can be either zero or one. Why is it so? If you try to uh, anti symmetrize uh, wave function with more, Fermions is the same level, it, it just doesn't work, it gives you zero. So we get all possible uh, wave functions again by even odd permutations of uh, this phase. Let's uh, take, uh, let's see uh, an example. Let's take uh, what we have wave function that was in third level. R1 wave function at the fifth level, R2. So in this case, N3 is one, N5 is 
one and all other numbers are zero, okay? So now we permute this and for two particles, there's only one uh, possibility to permutation. So we have to sum up two possible wave functions. Uh, let me draw it F3 R2, F5 R3. Uh, okay. Now what I have to do is to anti-symmetrize. So this uh, was uh, original. I uh, have to take care of this minus sign. It's a minus. All right. And then properly normalize it. Square root of two. That's a wave uh, function for two fermions, one of the third and another one on the fifth level. Uh, right, we also see why there could be no, no two particles in the same level. Uh, if I put three here, three here, let, let's see, it must be one, sorry. Uh, then this, this just vanishes upon anti-symmetrization. Right, so that was an example. Now I do it in generally. And uh, this is a summation over all particles, all uh, states. Funny enough, a piece of linear algebra comes about. Funny enough, all this uh, long expression makes sense, can be written in uh, other way, which is called slat tar determinant. Uh, determinant, uh, determinant of a matrix. So for our case of two particles, this matrix is the following. Three, R1, five, uh, R, one, that's first row, second row. Or uh, two. Uh, two. Okay. This is a matrix. So determinant is a product of these two minus product of these two. As you remember, formula for two by two determinant. And that's precisely what we wrote, symmetric and anti-symmetric combination. That works for any number of particles. It's letter determinant. But again, for 10 particles, just writing this uh, letter determinant would be enormous task. Well, we can compute uh, this normalization factor and computation is precisely the same as uh, we did for bosons. So we just uh, get the total number of permutations times C squared, that should be one. So we can figure out C, and the formula is precisely the same, but now I have taken uh, into account the fact that uh, NK can be either zero or one. And for both these values, uh, the um, factorial is one, right? So I end up with this. Number of possible uh, uh, states is n factorial. Good. So it's a rather boring job. Uh, it is simple but boring. The prescription is simple but kind of uh, approving. 
uh, carrying this out, uh, includes many, many terms, decisions. So one gets already bored while thinking of this word. But fortunately, our course is not that boring, I expect. And oh, okay, there was a question. Uh, why this phi i in the determinant instead of uh, phi i e? This phi, uh, this e, lower index is precisely i j. That's why I wrote this comment, uh, this. Um, Again, let me write, write it again. This later determinant. Um, um, so index G i is here. It is three in this case, and it is five, five in in another case. All right. Again, determinant. Let me repeat it again. Is the product of two elements on the main diagonal minus the product two elements on the complementary diagonal. That's what we have seen. Product of these two. And oh, no, sorry, I have to put Arthur here. Sorry, uh, here in, in all the row, uh, in all the column, R is R2. Um, good, another question. Uh, okay, never mind. Uh, I will never mind. Um, good. So we, uh, we, 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 um, we have completed fermions. Let us see. Now we can accomplish. Actually, it's uh, perhaps it's some Zoom effect. It's the first time I give this lecture in, in Zoom. Uh, usually, I'm slightly behind the schedule now. I'm pretty much ahead of the schedule, so I think I answered many questions. Mm -hmm. uh, sir, your education is much more efficient than previously. Fox space. First of all, why do we need a new space? We have already made the space of mm -hmm. all possible solutions of string equation. Uh, that wasn't uh, perhaps not uh, an easy space, but uh, yeah, it was easy to construct. But we understood that it contains just too many wave functions, which we absolutely don't need. We have to clean up. Right, so how we do this Fox bus? At each end, we take all possible solutions of string equations. Then the idea of Fock is to combine all these spaces in one large space, right? So there is yet another index, which is number of particles, which uh, shows uh, the possible states of the system. All states with two particles are orthogonal to the states with three particles and so on. So the independent blocks in Hilbert space, independent uh, uh, dimensions. All right, so we combine all these type uh, spaces. What is important is so to include Empty, empty state, no particles. It's also a legal state in Fox space. And as, as we'll see uh, in practice, a very important one. Good, we combine all these uh, states 
And uh, now we have to run the procedure we just did. We have to anti-symmetrize these basic states. And we throw away all states which disagree with symmetry postulate. Okay, I uh, want to mention that step one and step three, four eventually uh, can be exchanged. One could first anti-symmetrize or symmetrize it at a given number of n and throw away the states and only then uh, combine all states in, uh, in um, book space. So in this way, we got a Fox space and uh, how we can define Fox space and what's the major convenience to be in Fox space. Uh, each set of occupation numbers presents the state uniquely. That's what I said. Symmetry postulate uh, reduces number of states and uh, makes each state's state unique. So each element, each uh, basis state in Fox space is uh, labeled by this long row, in principle, infinite uh, row of numbers, numbers, particles in each level. And there is very special element, vacuum, when there are no particles anywhere at any level. That makes it Fock space. Right, so let us see uh, where we are and where we will be going. So we have formulated the problem. We need to get quantum, uh, quantum mechanical description of uh, a system of many identical particles. Could be electrons in the store, in the solid bosons and water, whatever. We, we will see such systems uh, every, every moment, right? And uh, in principle, we have already solved this. We have made a proper space, proper quantum mechanical space, box space. Now we could put Hamiltonian into this Fox space, consider diagonal, non-diagonal elements, make perturbation theory, make everything. Since we uh, have defined proper space to work it. However, I need to stir the space. The space itself and especially elements of the space, uh, the basis uh, functions are pretty complex. Antisymmetration can contain zillions of uh, terms. And it's impossible to uh, uh, get intuitive gasp on their properties, impossible to understand. Uh, we need a better picture. We need better orientation in this uh, folk space. And we need more efficient tools to work with the systems of identical particles. So we will go on with the next lecture and that will be what people usually call second quantization. So we'll have a lecture about second quantization. Let's see, messages to take uh, home. Yeah, perhaps it, it will be good for um, take home messages. Symmetry postulate, reduction of number of states, remaining states are um, collected into Fox pass. That gives, gives us a proper basis to work with identical particles, but technically it's still uh, not clear how to proceed, so we need to go far. Good, well, I'm five minutes ahead of schedule, it seems. Oh, sorry, only. Good, 
So please, any questions? Which steps can be switched in the creation of Fox space again? Uh, step two. Step two is uh, combining uh, subspaces in a single space. Right? This step two. It can be put after steps three and four. So first one could then symmetrize basis states at each given n. Throw away all states which don't which we don't need, and only them combine all subspaces at different n. Good. More questions. Uh, let's see. I was wondering what a wave function of multiple particles tell us about the positions of those particles or any other observable. For one particle, we can find the statistical position of a particle by integrating uh, the square wave function in an interval uh, a, b. How does integrating the squared wave function for multiple particles uh, relate to this? I wouldn't think of uh, integrating. Uh, I would just take a square wave, wave function. So uh, probability to find uh, one fermion at uh, R1 and another fermion at R2 would be um, the square root of this uh, wave function. This is uh, probability to get a particle at R1 and R2. One cannot say which, which uh, fermion you, you have, but you can have fermion at R1, at R1 and R2. So this um, probability is naturally symmetric. Uh, does this answer your question? All right. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you for attending the lecture. I uh, actually pretty, pretty much uh, be willing to get so many questions. Understood that the topic was uh, interesting, very philosophical, but still uh, I'm pleased to, 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 to have so many questions. So with this, let me uh, stop the recording. Oh, I cannot stop it. I don't have to record the end of my life.